Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A-Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and I am still on Chapter 16 of the A-Level Biology Syllabus, which is Inherited Change. Um, so in the past couple of videos, we did some genetic crosses and we learned how sex linkage, um, linkages work. And in this video, I want to show you how to do a chi-squared test. I'm going to introduce the chi-squared test to you and then I will show you an example from the textbook and how to work out the example. So I will try to put in as much detail as possible so that you're able to follow. If you did not watch the video before this one, you would not be able to follow the example as you should. So I suggest that you watch that one so that you just get an idea of where the example started from because it is sort of a continuation of one of the examples in the previous video um, to this one. So what is the chi-square test? The chi-square test is a simple statistical test that is used to determine if the difference between what we observe and what we expect um, are significant. So for example, um, you know, we've been doing quite a number of crosses and sometimes you would find that in some of the crosses that we do, we get a ratio of maybe three to one for the phenotypes. Um, three being, let's say, um, the dominant phenotype and one being the recessive phenotype. When we do such crosses in real life, we don't necessarily always get this ratio. So in real life, let's say, for example, let me think of an example such as sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic trait and people usually inherit the recessive allele from both parents for them to express the trait. But if, for example, we had a situation whereby um, one of the parents was heterozygous, so they were normal. I'm just going to do um, some of my annotations here in the corner. So let's say this was a heterozygous parent, A being the normal allele and S being the sickle cell allele. And they were crossed with, um, let's say, someone else who has the exact same uh, genotype as they do. What this cross tells us here is that they can have an offspring that would be AA. They can have one that would be AS. They can have another one here that would also be AS and they can have one that would be SS. So this offspring, um, this cross rather, is telling us that whenever there's a cross between these two ind individuals, there's a 25% chance of them having a child that would have sickle cell anemia. There's a 50% chance of them having a child that would be a carrier, um, which means the child would have the sickle cell allele but would not be ill. The child would not express that allele. And there's a 25% chance of them having a normal um, a normal offspring. So in this case, if we were to do this cross in real life, some people um, get really lucky and this 25% chance is the one that prevails over here. And they might have three children and all the children would be um, AA. Or they might be, um, it might be otherwise and then they would have all children as SS or they might just be lucky and have all the children being AS. The point of it is that when we do these kinds of crosses, we are basically trying to guess or we are hypothesizing, if I can put it that way, what the results would be. And so what the chi-squared test does is it takes that hypothesis that we have um, or the predictions that we've made. I think that's a better way to think about it. It takes the predictions that we've made and it compares it to the real life results and then checks if there's any significant difference between the two. So that is what we are going to look at in the video today. So now let's look at um, an example from the textbook. If you did not watch the previous video, please do so because like you can see, this is a continuation of a question we've already solved in the previous video so that you can follow fully and just really understand. I've also plugged it in here as a suggestion so you can just click the link and maybe watch it quickly before you come back to this one. All right, so now let's look at this. The question says, look back to your answer from that question. And in the actual crosses between the animals in this generation, the numbers of each phenotype obtained in the offspring were as follows. And it lists the phenotype and it says, use a test to determine whether or not the difference between these observed results and the expected results is significant. First things first, this is the formula for a chi-square test, and I'm going to explain what each of these terms mean. O stands for what we call the observed number. The observed number is the number that's usually given in the question. So over here, it's the number that's, the, the observed numbers rather, are the numbers that result from the actual 
mating process. So after the offspring are born, the number of offspring that we see and the phenotypes that are expressed, that would be the observed number. The expected number is the number that we expect to see for each phenotype based on the ratio we have predicted. And I'll explain that in a bit. Um, and that's basically all you need to know about the chi-square. O is for expected um, for observed number and E is for expected number. Now, when we did the previous question that we are supposed to continue with here, these were the ratios that we got. So we got the gray and long in terms of the phenotype um, was nine. In terms of for gray and short, it was three. White and long was three and white and short was one. When you're doing the chi-square test and for most statist um, statistical tests that you have to do in this level of biology, as a matter of fact, for most statistical tests out there, the null hypothesis is always that there is no significant difference. OK, so if you are asked in the exam to write what your null hypothesis is for um, statistical test, it is always that there is no significant difference between the observed and the expected, or there is no significant difference between the two data sets. There is no significant difference between the means of the data set. Basically, null hypothesis is that there is no significant difference. OK, so we are saying that's our null hypothesis. Let's see if that's true to get us. Um, walking through this i've sort of prepared a table so i also have my calculator here with me i know you can't see me but um just declaring all things transparently that i'm not doing the calculations off my head and so we are going to walk through it together okay so here if you notice what i've done with the table i've sort of stated the observed number i've also stated something called the expected ratio and then the expected number and we'd go on with our calculations that would lead us to the chi-square value in this case, the, the observed number, like I said, has already been given, all right? So for gray and long, that's 54. For gray and short, it's 4. For white and long, it's also 4. And for white and short, it's 18, okay? These are numbers that were given to us in the question because they said when the actual cross was done, these were the things that the offspring, they had 54 offspring with um, gray and long, for offspring with gray and short and so on and so forth. Expected ratio is the ratio that we predict when we do our predictive cross. So in this case, we did a dihybrid cross. And every time you do a dihybrid cross, the um, total is um, often 16 if you do it between two heterozygous individuals. Um, so in this case, if you add 9 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1, you're going to get 16. So the total of our expected ratio here is 16, and that becomes important in just a bit. But look at it here, gray and long. When we counted the phenotypes in that previous example, we counted nine gray and long possibilities. So that means our expected ratio for gray and long is nine. For gray and short is three. For white and long is also it's also three, and for white and short it's one. These are expected ratios. These are not expected numbers, which means that we're simply saying if we have let's say a total of three hundred, we expect that out of that three hundred, nine out of if we're calculating the ratios, we'll say 9 out of 16 times 300 would be a certain phenotype. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. We're going to calculate the expected number. So in this case, first of all, the expected number would be the ratio for that particular phenotype, in this case, gray and long. I'm just going to do gray and long as an example here. The ratio for that um, particular phenotype, which is 9 in this case, divided by the total um, ratio if you add them together times the total population of these here so this I think I can do off by heart 54 plus 4 is 58 plus 4 that's another uh, that's 62 and 62 plus 18 is 80 okay so in this case we have 80 offspring in total and so this we can actually do because that would be 5 over there and that tells us that the expected number here should be 45 for that uh, particular phenotype. I hope that made sense. So if you did not get it, I'm just going to say it again. You add all the ratio, the ratio total for your dihybrid cross if you've done the cross between two heterozygotes. Um, so you would find here that that would give you 16 as the total. And then you take what the expected ratio is for each phenotype 
divide it by the total ratio and multiply that by the total number of organisms um, that you're getting. So based on the observed number of organisms that or offspring that you get, you can add all of those together to get your total number. And over here, the total number is 80. OK, so now we're going to do it for gray and short as well. So let's look over there for gray and short is three divided by 16 times 80. Um, 16 and 80 is five. OK, so three times five just tells you that's 15. And obviously, because this is the same ratio as this one, um, you know that this would also be 15. And over here we have one over 16 times 80, which is one times five. And so this should be five. What this is telling us here is that we are saying that based on our predicted ratio, I'm just going to erase these um, scribblings over here. I hope you got what I did there, though. If you didn't, please just hit rewind a little bit. But I'm trying to leave enough room for us to be able to do um, any other calculations that might be necessary. OK, what this um, is told us basically is that when the actual cross was done, these were the numbers that they got. But when we predicted, we predicted that from 80 offspring, these would be the ratios for each phenotype. And based on those ratios, this should be the numbers that they should be getting. So the chi-square test is basically saying, is there a difference between here and here? What's the difference between these two um, sets of data? So let us then go on. We have our observed minus expected squared. So the observed number here is 54 and our expected is 45 and that gives us a value of 9. And if we square 9, we are going to get 81. OK, so I'm just going to put 81 over here. And again, remember, we're working based on the formula here. So I'm just going to erase so you can see the formula a lot better. It's over here on the left. OK, so that um, that's what we're following. All right, then let's look again over here. This is gray and short, the observed number minus expected number squared. So 4 minus 15 is 11. Um, that's actually minus 11. But if you square it, it becomes positive. Um, and that should give us 121. I hope that is the square of 11. Um, so that should give us 121. And obviously, the same thing would apply here because the numbers are exactly the same. And so we have 121 again. And over here, 18 minus 5 is um, 13. And if we square 13, we are going to get 169. Okay, so now we have those. And I'm sure you're like, okay, what, what happens next? Then we take these values here and we divide them by the expected number. Please note that the expected ratio is not the one that is denoted as E. It's the expected number that is denoted that way. So we're going to take these numbers and divide them by the expected number, which means that over here we then say 81 divided by 45. So here we, I certainly need a calculator. Um, and this is going to tell us, this is going to give us 1.8. Okay. And um, here it's 121 divided by 15. Okay. 121 divided by 15. And that gives us 8.07. I hope you're also trying this out in your notebook if you have it before you. And the same thing would happen here. Um, 121 divided by 15. That is another 8.07. And over here we have 169 divided by 5. And we have 33.8. Okay. Once we have all of these values, we then need to sum them together because of this summation sign here. And that is what would give us our chi-square value. So if we were to add all of these together, 33.8 plus 8.07 plus 8.07 plus 1.8, that gives us a chi-square value of 51.74. Okay. I hope you followed that. Um, if you didn't, please just watch it again. But this is typically how you get the chi-square value. But this is not where it ends. So now we have a chi-square value. I'm just going to write it here of 51.74. OK, I'm just going to try to make this a bit thicker. Good. All right, so 51.74 is our chi-square value. And now we want to check if 
like what does this tell us it doesn't really say anything right because we're trying to see if there's a significant difference between the observed numbers and the expected numbers in order to do that successfully we use something called the p-value um, or the p-statistic if you wish which is basically just a probability number and the critical point for the p-value is 0 0.05 and this here is the rule that governs how you interpret the p-value. If p is less than 0 0.05, the difference between what you're looking at, so basically the two data sets, is significant. So you have to reject the null hypothesis. Because remember, the null hypothesis states that there is no significant difference. So if your p-value is less than 0 0.05, that tells you there is a significant difference. If p is greater than 0 0.05, the difference is not significant, so you accept your null hypothesis. So here, let's look at how we then determine what the p-value is. If we look at the value that we've got in here, we have 51.74. 51.74 um, is our number. But before we can even look at the p-value, we first need to calculate what we call the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom, usually written as df, is basically equal to n minus 1. n means the number of data points, um, not data points, the number of data sets that you have, or data points, depending on what you're dealing with. In this case, our number of data points is 3, or data sets is 3 minus 1, and so, I'm sorry, it's 4 minus 1, because we have four different phenotypes. Um, and so that means our degree of freedom is equal to 3. Okay, so now here we go. Degree of freedom is 3. So we are now going to be looking here where 3 is along this line over here. If degree of freedom is 3, then we say, okay, where is P equal to 0 0.05? These are the values of P up here. At P equals to 0 0.05, the chi-square value is 7.82. By the way, I got this table from the textbook, and I also just want to say to you that as a student, you're not expected to know this table. Um, the question would usually provide you with a table from which you can read your data. So don't be too worried about it, okay? Just learn how to read it um, accurately. So let's go again. We've calculated our degree of freedom. We had four phenotypes. We deduct one from that, we get three, okay? So we know that we are reading at the layer where three is, or at the row where three is. All right. And so um, first things first is we look for where P is equal to 0 0.05. This is how I teach students to do it anyway. At P is equal to 0 0.05, the chi-square value is 7.82. Um, I think I should use a different pen color so that it's just easy because I think there's so many circles here. Okay. So 7.82 is a P value. But the chi-square value we have is 51.74. That is way above what 7.82 is. The next thing we then need to do is to check what the trend of the table looks like at the degree of freedom being equal to 3. So if P is 0 0.05 um, is equal to 7.82 here, if you look to the right, you see that the values are increasing, okay? So you can see here it becomes 11.34 and then it becomes 16.72. So it's basically increasing in this direction. So that means our 51.74 will lie somewhere to the right of this row on the table here. Okay, so our p-value, um, our chi-square value is farther to the right. So if that's the case, we can then look at what is happening with the p-value as well. In this case, the p-value 0.01, that is less than 0.05. And then as we go on, it becomes even more less than 0.05. And so it means that when we get to the chi-square value of 51.74, we're going to have a p-value that's way, way less than 0.05. And so that tells us that p itself is less than 0.05 for the chi-square value that we have calculated. And that suggests that the difference between the two data sets we are looking at is significant and we must reject the null hypothesis. I hope that was clear because this is where I'm going to stop this video. But if you were confused in any way, you can try to watch it again or you can just post a, a question in the comments and I'm sure we will be able to get back to you. And by we, I mean either myself or someone from the learning community. Thank you so much for watching and I believe the next couple of videos would simply be about mutations and how genes are controlled. So I hope that you enjoy those. Have a good time. Goodbye.